Okay, well, welcome everybody. This is Grandmaster Alexander Lenderman um, for chesslessons.com and uh, in these videos I'm going to be covering the blitz match that I have played against Max Lugi at Columbia University. And uh, we'll start with game one when, where I was black. And um, now before we go on to actual games, I want to talk about the psychology of actually playing a match where you're playing 20 games against a specific opponent. So um, I knew that Max is uh, always pretty much almost always uh, exclusively a d4 player and uh, he knows the openings pretty well. Uh, so my first goal was to also know the one specific opening very well in blitz so that I can also comfortably blitz out moves and understand ideas and so on. Uh, another thing I noticed was that Max likes to outplay people. He has a very good chess understanding. He has a lot of experience. I believe he once was a World Blitz champion. He was worked with Karpov, so he actually he has a really good uh, fundamental understanding of the game and base a good basis. So my goal was to first of all play something that I haven't played before because that would obviously surprise him that would throw away all his preparation out the window and second of all i wanted to play something a little bit more sharp a little bit more unusual so that he would have to kind of think from move one so therefore i was thinking about what kind of opening might be good to fit this kind of requirement and like i said since it's a blitz match um and uh, i'm playing against only one person I was able to prepare specifically that line and even though I never played that before but for this match it was possible to be ready and especially that since Max plays uh, is a very predictable player he plays almost the same things all the time it was much easier to do preparation so he played d4 as expected and I played knight f6 c4 and c5 so the first surprise normally I just play something like e6 um, and then Nims or Queen's Indian or some kind of Queen's Gambit declined or Rogozian. But in this case, I decided to go for a sharper lines. So I'm giving him a space advantage, but my goal was here to play a Benko Gambit. Because I saw that against the Benko Gambit, he plays this line with f3. And uh, he is actually uh, uh, in really optimistic about this move because he was actually talking about how uh, like 20-25 years ago he played against Lev Albert and Lev Albert almost stopped playing the Banco against him stuff like that so he's really uh, he he's really confident about this move so I, I decided to look into it because I figured okay maybe I looked at it for a while back with white and I figured maybe if it really is that good, maybe it'll be a good weapon with white. And uh, worst comes to worst, I'll learn something anyway. If not, maybe I'll find a way to get a good position against this line because he played it 20, 25 years ago, but now computers changed everything. And I just decided to see what's going on. And I was very fortunate that I found actually a really, really nice improvement. So I played e6, which is actually one of the critical lines. Uh, of course, black can play also moves like g6, typical lines, um, or queen a5, or a takes b5, but e6 is the most principled line. e4, e takes d5, and now this is all pretty much theory. e5 is logical, because if he takes e takes d5, then I think I can get a good position f many ways, because f3 then kind of is a weakness on the dark squares, uh, and uh, the king is a little bit weaker and um, and for example I can play a move like queen e7 and already it's actually kind of awkward for for him because uh, if he blocks knight e2 then this bishop gets blocked for example bishop e3 is impossible obviously queen e2 hangs the d5 pawn so it's actually kind of uh, already a little bit awkward for him. For example, another move could be bishop d6. 
just developing and uh, uh, putting pressure on this diagonal. Uh, so, you know, basically I have a pretty good compensation. So therefore the main line is to play e5. And now of course I have to play queen e7 because if I move my knight then the d5 pawn would hang. So queen e2 is a natural move because again he's renewing the threat in the knight. Now I play knight g8, it's a main move. Knight c3 attacking the d5 pawn, bishop b7, knight h3. So that's the, the knight Basically, it's simple chess going on. The other two squares, f3 and e2, are taken. So he goes to the logical square h3, trying to go to f4 and putting pressure on d5. But luckily, this has all been played before, and I kind of expected that he would go into it because, you know, it looks like a very attractive line for white. But luckily, there is an improvement for black. So c4. So the idea of that move is to after knight f4 to play queen c5 and defending the d5 pawn. So obviously I want to try to control the center. And also I want to get the queen out of e7 at some point because eventually I want to have to try to develop my pieces. So bishop knight takes d5. Now this is obviously um, all preparation and I still knew about it because this has all been played before. This is a nice computer line. Of course simple bishop e3 would run to d4 and forking two pieces. So knight takes d5. Otherwise, the whole plan does not make sense for white. Otherwise, black just gets a good position. Bishop takes d5, bishop e3. So now queen b4 is forced to pin the knight because otherwise I just lose the bishop. a3, queen a5, bishop d2, bishop e6, knight d5. And here is a really critical moment. Um, he, uh, this is where this this move practically almost like possibly even won't be in the match because this move basically was a novelty that took away one of his big weapons in the Benko Gambit and basically after that he started he was already desperate to try to find some way to uh, some way to play with white whenever you basically uh, eliminate one of opponents big weapons it's already a huge advantage uh, in the match. Um, it's happened in all the matches before with Carlson Anand and uh, Anand Topalov and uh, uh, Kasparov against, uh, of course the really famous example Kasparov against Kramnik where Kramnik played the Berlin and Kasparov just couldn't do anything about it. Same thing here and especially it's even wor more desperate in the Blitz match because in the Blitz match you don't have whole day next day to prepare you basically whatever you have you already have you can't exactly improvise so it's a really difficult situation before that most people have played the move queen d8 to keep in touch with the c7 square and then uh queen takes c4 uh rook, c rook a7 to again guard this and now strong move rook c1 remember this move rook c1 threatening knight c7 and this was played in the game Nakamura against Vachir Lagrav in 2008 and White got a good advantage in that game, good initiative and uh, Nakamura later on won the game with White. So this was what Max was counting on. But unfortunately for him, I already knew about this idea and computer found this really nice move, c3. After which, unfortunately, bishop takes c3, queen d8. The difference now is that if you were to play queen c4, I will play rook a7, and suddenly the same move rook c1 does not threaten knight c7 anymore because the bishop here blocks the. Uh, so uh, I can just take a takes b5, and I'm, I'm up a piece, and uh, white does not really have enough compensation. So therefore, Max tried to move queen e4, which uh, isn't not really a, a best move, but okay, it's blitz, so maybe he saw he, maybe he he already knew that I tricked him, so he tried to also trick me a little bit, and it worked because actually here I made not the best move. Uh, in this position, I made the most obvious move rook a7 because to defend the rook because knight c7 was a threat, 
before that. But the best move was to play ATXB5 and give up the exchange. Simply take an important pawn and after knight c7, queen takes c7, queen takes a8 and simply bishop c5. And okay, I have a very good position. I'm going to develop my knight, I'm going to castle. I, I still have two pieces for rook, I have material advantage and his king is a little bit weak and I have an advantage. So um, that was the best but in blitz I wasn't able to figure out so I played the the tempting rook i7 and here is the last chance where max could have got a reasonable game because then if i play rook b7 then he can take so that's what he should have tried uh, but it was again it's uh, quite a difficult move to found and, and he he played the more logical tempting rook c1 but now after this basically i'm up a piece and i'm consolidating and basically his max is running out of initiative. Castles he played, knight g7. Natural developing move, challenging the knight on d5. Knight e3, so he does not really want to develop my own pieces. So, But unfortunately now my game just uh, becomes very comfortable. I played queen b6 with the idea to attack the pressure on the knight on uh, e3. He played a4 defending, I played knight d5, pinning the knight and attacking it again. Bishop d2, bishop c5, rook f e1, castles, king h1, and here a little bit more accurate was to take with the bishop, but again, it's really hard to find, uh, figure this out in blitz. This would have been just a piece up. Instead, I played knight takes e3. Uh, he played rook takes e3. Uh, instead of that, he still he had one more chance to kind of get back into the game, which was really strong, almost impossible to find in blitz. Rook takes c5, queen takes c5, bishop takes c3, attacking my rook, and after queen e7, a really strong move b4, not even taking the rook, but just threatening to go go b b4, and then just to go bishop c5, and surprisingly he has a little bit of compensation. Although I'm still better, but uh, not as much, but. Okay, this is almost impossible to figure out in the blitz, so he tried rook takes e3, bishop takes e3, bishop takes e3, queen b8, takes, 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 and here he made a decisive mistake, he took on c6, well no, this is actually fine still, here he made a decisive mistake, he played before, he was probably not too happy with his position at this point, I mean material is equal, three pieces, three pawns for the piece, but the pawns are not going anywhere, uh, my bishop is really rock solid and his pawns are all very weak. And here he made a decisive mistake and after rook c8 the game is lost. I'm winning the queen for rook and uh, and here he made uh, of course the mistake and I did not take advantage. What's the best way for black to win here? Uh, give you like 3 seconds, you can pause it if you want. Okay, time is up. It was queen a, queen a1, and then queen e5. So that was bad. I did not find it in the blitz game. Instead, I just took this. I won this pawn. Now, and now this is like queen and three against rook and three, which is an easy technical win. But okay, I'll show it to you anyway. He played h4, which kind of uh, makes makes the win quicker. Let's say he just plays uh, rook e4. So how do I win this? Okay, so I can play queen a1, make it, let's say I play a5, let's say here, somehow here, let's say he plays here. Okay, and then eventually I have to try to get g4 in, uh, or maybe h4 and then g4 in, and then eventually trade off the pawns and get queen against rook. Or maybe even in a better version. Like actually he already is having trouble finding a move. Because any pawn will be a weakness. And king g3 runs into queen g1. And the king gets trapped. So he already kind of is in a little bit of a zugzwang. Let's say he plays some passive move like rook f2. And then I could try this move. Um, let's say I could try this. Well, 
Maybe maybe just bring the make King bring the King up, and then just play G4. So let's say everything gets traded, and uh, then uh, and then okay, actually G3 practically. Uh, he's gonna the King's gonna run out of square. Basically, the idea is the Queen has to be centralized. It's important to try to keep the queen in the center because it controls a lot of squares. So anyway, the position is going to be easy to technically win, they just have to be a little bit patient. But, uh, no, Max of course knew that, so he tried to... But the problem is he cannot take on h4 because of queen e1 check. And after rook e4, I spend a little bit of time and then I calculated that the pawn endgame is very easily winning. I'm just gonna get him to Zugzwang and I'm gonna win the pawn endgame. Because if he plays e5, I can just play h6 and he's going to lose the pawn. So he played king h1, I played king g3. I'm not even going after this pawn, which I probably could, but then he can take this pawn. But first I'm taking care of business here. And basically, now that you moved here, if, if, you, were to move, if you were to move here, I would have played h3, traded and then come back and grab this pawn. And after this move, king f4, now he's not in time to go win this pawn. And from here on, it's an easy win. I'm going to trade off this pawn and uh, win with these pawns. So, simple. Of course, I did not have to do it. And if you do it, you have to be 100% sure, sure. But in this case, I wasn't. Uh, I was a win. So this was actually uh, probably, uh, uh, you know, usually the games once or not turning points in the match but this was one of these which was probably the turning point of the match because not only was like a hit on a hit a blow in his face because he did a lot of preparation he expected obviously to win the match but here in his own best line in his own weapon i find an improvement and i beat him and uh, basically ever since he didn't even look the same ever since in this match so that's why preparation in the blitz match is really really important actually even in a blitz match you know it doesn't even have to be a lot of concrete preparation but just has to be a couple of ideas here and there and uh, you know in the main weapon it's important to have a strong improvement and after that you're already in pretty good position so uh, I guess with that let's go on to the next game